Hey you guys, welcome to Special Education Academy. I am Karen Mayer Cunningham, Special Education Boss, helping families navigate and negotiate the IEP 504 process for everybody that sits at the table. We are so honored tonight to have Dr. Deanna Lenick, who is an expert in um, VOCD, Voice Output Communication Device and Augmented Communication, Communication, and she is going to share her expertise tonight. We're going to ask the questions that you guys have sent in, and she's going to train us and give us an insight that we didn't have. And so, Dr. Olenek, if you would introduce yourself. Awesome. Thank you for the invitation. And Karen, it's wonderful to be here with you um, sitting at the table for a conversation about communication and about language. And that's exactly where I want to be. Um, I have my master's in speech language pathology from Texas Tech University, and I have my PhD in early child development and education from, our, uh, from Texas Women's University. And it is uh, a long journey, or it has been a long journey. I had my first voice output communication device as an undergrad um, working in the clinic at North Dakota State University, and I fell in love with just the opportunity to help someone to develop a voice and to develop a way to be able to, to speak and communicate. And over the course of the last many years, um, that actually would have been, oh, i Anything over 20 years, we don't need to talk about, right? Um, but many years ago, the voice output communication devices were in play. They, they were beginning, as Karen joked about, the eight-track tapes and all to the origins of augmentative communication and the origins of what we now enjoy for high tech, touch screens, touch screens on computers and on phones and tablets that had its origins in special education. And so as we look at like, what is the role that we want augmentative communication to play? What is the role of special education? You know, I want everyone to really understand the value of what we do for special needs and how that contributes back to what you and I are able to enjoy just in, in our technology today. And so today's conversation is about getting us ready to go back to school and getting your students ready to go back to school. And from a parent perspective and from an educator perspective and from a speech language pathologist perspective, what do we need to be addressing so that language and the role of communication plays the role that it's supposed to um, in our educational settings. The way your teachers know what your students know is through communication. The way your teachers communicate to your students to help them to understand concepts is through communication. And communication is truly that bridge that makes learning happen and makes learning possible. And so as we approach the beginning of a new school year and think about your students who so hopefully have their own speech generating device, um, also known as a voice output communication device, or they have their own augmentative communication system. But there are some things that we need to think about when we're navigating um, with our programming and when we're planning for them at home. And those were really the at the forefront of what I wanted to have a conversation with you about this evening in thinking about how do we prepare for your child being able to use his or her voice during school. Um, the first is they need to have it with them. Have we planned for that? Have we planned for making sure that the speech generating device is charged and ready at the beginning of the day that is, is in your child's possession or if your child is not able to carry it with them, that there is a plan for how it will be moved from location to location so that it is set up and ready and available. What is the plan for that? And quite honestly, it doesn't matter if someone else is carrying and setting up the speech generating device or if your child is able to transport it, it 
him or herself, the goal is to make sure that it's there. If it's not there, it's kind of like, uh, you know, my analogy is leaving the walker at home or leaving the walker on the bus. You don't have it with you and there's no way that you can use it. Um, I like to think of and put augmentative communication in the same category with the rest of assistive technology. Walkers, wheelchairs, special seating, um, adaptive tools to help with writing. Augmentative communication is in that category of adaptive equipment. And when we think of it that way, there's no one out there who would deny a child a wheelchair if they needed a wheelchair. They wouldn't leave the child um, without a way to be able to move between locations. And the same power should be put with the value of the augmentative communication system. So that's really like key number one. You have to have it with you. We need to make sure that we've got a plan for, again, charging it and it being transported. Um, in the different locations and set up so that it's accessible to your student. The second element for me that's key is that you and I need to develop our proficiency with your student's system. We need to be able to use it. So whether your student is on GRID or ProLoco to Go or Unity 84 sequenced or Lamp Words for Life or Snap Plus Core First, and I don't want to leave any of the big players out, Touch Chat, Saltillo, right? I'm not aligned with any system, but we need to make sure that we know how to navigate and get to the language that's in that speech generating device. If we're not speaking to your student in his symbol system and verbally, then we're missing the opportunity to make that connection between the symbols and the verbal language. And so we need to have a concerted effort to develop our skills and to develop our proficiency. I can't tell you how many times I hear people say, I just ask him to help me find it. Well, then no one's modeling for your child. And language is learned through modeling, through imitation and approximation. It's learned naturally by hearing and seeing that language being made visible and being able to make that connection. If not, then if you're speaking verbally, the teacher is speaking verbally and not speaking in your student symbol system, then your student has to figure out the connection between what you said and what it looks like, what you said and how to get to it, what you said and how to navigate to create that message. You're leaving that part for them to figure out on themselves by themselves. And that just makes developing language so much more difficult. And so that second step is important at home as well as at school. It's important with our friends as well as with our family members. It's important with our classmates as well as with our teachers. And so having a plan to develop our own proficiency with the system. Please know that it is against the ASHA code of ethics for me to align with one particular system. For me to tell you that your child needs to have this system because it's the one I know best. That's against ASHA's code of ethics for us to do that. And even for like a team and a school district to say, that's aligning with a product and we're not to do that, not when we're fitting a child with an augmentative communication system or a student with an augmentative communication system. And so outside of that, what it means is I need to make sure that I am developing my proficiency with that and have a plan for that. So that's point number two. Point number three is we need to be symboling our language. We need to be speaking in symbols so that that connection is made. And there's times when that instruction is happening from the front of the classroom and there's students with multiple different systems in the classroom. 
So the solution at that point is to consider that the language being spoken on your different speech generating devices, that language is a dialect of a visual system, much like, and Karen, I'm sorry, you've got kind of the queen of that Southern accent. You've got that really going on. You've got that deep South accent, but there's no one who would tell you from the front of the classroom that you need to change that, right? We don't dictate dialects. You know, we can have a teacher come in from the Northeast. We can some, have someone come in from the Northwest and we don't dictate dialects. So when we consider the visual representation of the symbols as being a dialect of the spoken language and not a different language, because it's still English in, in the classroom, it's still English and people may have a second language that's on their device, but that primary educational instruction in the United States is gonna be through English. And so our visual representations of lamp words for life, of proloco to go, of touch chat, of snap plus core first, of grid, those different symbol systems are a dialect. So when the teacher's teaching from the front of the classroom, the teacher may choose one of those dialects. That's a way for them to be able to provide that symbolization or that symboling from the front of the classroom. And it may be on a speech generating device or it may be on a low tech communication board. There is a third option. So low tech communication board or a speech generating device. The third option is symbol it. And that's a way to do speech to symbol translation. Again, from the front of the classroom, it gives the teacher a way to be able to speak to the students in real time by speaking and then it does a translation for it. But the most important aspect of this is make sure that we're using the symbols as we're providing the education and the instruction. I want you also to think about those incidental learning opportunities and the times that we want to make sure that we're symboling like, hold up a second, your friends don't like it when you do that. I mean, who stops and says that on a speech generating device? Not many of us. Or wait up, your shoes are untied. If we don't stop and tie them right now, you might trip, right? There's lots of learning that happens outside of those structured times. So make sure that you're thinking about even at home, at home and at school, ways to be able to share those messages in symbols on their speech generating device with a low tech communication board or um, by using the app for Symbolit. And the last um, component of this is to document it. If it's not documented, Karen will give me a big amen on this one. If it's not documented, it's not gonna happen. So where do you put this in the IEP? Where do you document this so that others know what's expected of them? Most of these types of instructions show up in the accommodations and modifications section. That's your place to be able to say who's carrying the device, who's setting it up, what does that need to look like? And you can describe that for the different academic settings that they're in over the course of the day. You can put it along with their schedule. And so making sure that their speech generating device is with them and set up and accessible. If it's in a backpack, even if it came with them, it's not usable there. No one can use it to talk to your student and your student can't use it to talk to others. I'm gonna jump on a, a side note right here. I get asked the question a lot of times about us using the student's speech generating device and is it not their own personal device? And should we have a, a mirrored system or a similar system set up on a different device? There's two parts to that answer. One is, I want your student to be able to say for themselves, yes, it's okay, or no, it's not. And so we need to develop that language for it so that your student can say, it's okay, or it's not okay. Right, we want that personal decision. So to give your student the 
language and help them to develop the language to be able to say yes, no, go, not, not you, right? Even if it's not real complex to be able to protest, that's huge in the world of language. And I'd love for your students to be able to say that. The other is sometimes there are some of the systems that it's not possible for us to have a mirrored system. And so there's a couple of devices that the particular layout of their speech generating device can't be put on an iPad or a second device. It's very specific for the, their, your student. In those cases, I would want to encourage your child to let others be able to talk on it so that when they talk, you can see what it is that they're saying, but you can still tell them, no, stop, hold up, wait, my turn, I want to, right? When we use language to control our world versus having rules that are used to, to protect, it really helps us to develop those social relationships and the value of language and being able to tell others. Um, but so I'm going to circle back around to the documented. If that is a major issue for your child, that's a time to be able to comment in the IEP about your child's very specific expectations for it. The last thing in the documentation that I'd love to encourage parents to do is to ask the IEP committee, ask whoever is writing the deliberations, to take down your description of your student's speech generating system. It gets left out a lot of times. And if it's nowhere in the documents and your student moves campuses or you move districts, where are we gonna find that information about what your layout and configuration was of your system? But you as a parent have the right to be able to say, my child is on an Accent 1400 set with core scanner and uses two switches in order to be able to get to all of the vocabulary in it, then now you've got that described. I also would encourage you to say if it's a school district provided or if it's a personally provided speech generating device. The deliberations give you a place where you have a say and can, can just make sure that that is a part of, of the records. Um, and you're less likely to have people who will come in and say, oh, but we can change that because all it describes is a speech generating device with so many locations and of this size. That doesn't give us enough specifics. But once your child has begun to develop his or her language on the specific speech generating device, we don't want to change it easily because time has been invested to develop language to the point it is. Doesn't mean we're never going to change that system, but it means we need to really stop and think about the impact that any system changes will have on your student's language. So it's all about the it's, um, have it, and develop it, and symbol it, and document it to make sure that you're ready and prepared for returning back to school. So Karen. You know, you're the only person that makes me not talk while I'm awake. So I, I'm just, and I talk when I'm asleep. Just so good. So thank you for that. Tell us again. Have it. Have it, develop it, symbol it, and document it. And that's in the handout that will be available on our Symbol, um, symbol Speak Facebook page and our Symbol It um, messaging. So that can be downloaded for the parents and it gives a description of each, each of those four different things that we want to make sure that we're doing. Okay. And tell us where that is again. I'll have. Courtney, put that in the chat later. Great. So it'll be up on our website at www.symbolspeak.co, and it truly is .co. Um, and, um, and then it'll also be on our Facebook page, and that's at Symbol Speak, and that's uh, the Facebook site. Okay. Awesome. 
So um, I only have 75 million questions. So um, it's so good. So I know when you and I talked uh, before and um, um, you had described, which would turn on the light bulb for me, um, you would you sort of described if there was somebody that was receiving um, sign language from somebody else signing, they wouldn't be the only person in the room signing. So that mirroring, um, that modeling, that mirroring, that um, checking for somebody that's leading with it correctly. I know that's not good English. Can you talk more about that? Because I can probably count on one hand using zero fingers, how many times I know that that occurs in a school. Um, a kiddo has an augmentative communication device and then they use this word I can't stand. They have access to it. Oh, um, but I have never, I can barely work my cell phone, right? That's why we have teenagers. Um, and so when I sit at meetings all over the United States, I don't do that. I don't, she does that. I don't, I mean, I don't even know that the staff members have been trained. It's not their fault. They haven't been mm -hmm. trained, but really at the end of the day, whose responsibility is that to also as a professional in the school, know it and teach it by modeling it. And then two part question, my question is always 10 parts. Who is responsible for loading on new content? I'm using a little more language than I used last week, but I'm certainly using more than my, I don't know, 12 sight words from kindergarten. Gotcha. So um, the who is going to depend on your specific school district. So the who begins with a speech language pathologist because it's in the area of language. It's about another mode of communication for language. So the speech language pathologist is going to take the lead. That's going to be the person who would have identified at first that your student needed an additional mode of communication in order to develop their language. Okay, so fancy words, but really means something very simple. Verbal language is not developing as it's expected, and your student needs the opportunity to develop language through a modality that's accessible for them. What can they get to? What can they do? Speech requires the coordination of approximately 100 muscles. That's a lot. It's the coordination of breathing, turning on the vocal folds for phonation, and then it's the muscles of articulation, which are really fine-tuned. The articulation movements are finer than any fine motor movements we would do with our hands, okay? So that coordination of speech takes about 100 muscles to be able to do that. The coordination of writing takes approximately 20. Wow. So when we're looking at a mode of communication, that will be accessible for your student. We're looking for a way for them to get to symbolic language so that they can develop, develop all of those wonderful thoughts and ideas in their head, right? And be able to express them. And so we look for a different mode. And that mode means, how are they going to get to it? I can speak, that's a mode of communication. I can write, that's one of my modes of communication. I can type, that's another mode of my communication. And I can even text shorthand, that's another mode of communication. I can also sign, but I only sign at about a three-year-old level, so it's not gonna take me very far. Um, but I can use that as an additional mode of communication. So what's your student's mode of communication? What's that access, the way that they're gonna get to it? So the speech language pathologist should be the one leading that conversation to find a mode of communication that's gonna be accessible for your student. In the school districts, we have assistive technology leads. Um, and depending on the school district, that team may be in, have a, a dedicated person who is leading that, that group. Assistive technology encompasses augmentative communication and envision um, enhancements, as well as auditory enhancements, as well as motor enhancements. And so assistive technology means it covers a lot of different areas and augmentative communication is one of those. So 
long answer to a short question. Who at my school is responsible? My speech language pathologist and the assistive technology team. They're the ones who are going to be responsible for implementing, sharing the information with the educators based on what's written in that IEP. How do we help others to understand what their role is? Now, your teachers will rely on your speech path and your assistive technology team to know what's the system that they're on. How do I use it? How do I speak? How much does your child speak on it? Where are they in their language development? That's all information that the teacher needs to know in order to be able to provide that support for your child in the classroom. Your classroom assistants are also gonna need to know Specifically, if you've got someone who's assigned to or is your primary um, person that's working with your child. So assistive technology teams should have sign off sheets that indicate that they receive the tools and that they receive the instruction um, that they needed in order to be able to apply those accommodations and modifications in the classroom. Long answer. Yes, and I've never asked a short question. So thank you for that. So then um, looking at, you know, what I do all day long is help craft IEP documents. So I have Billy Smith, he gets, he's in elementary school, he gets two speech sessions for about 30 minutes a week, which is pretty standard. Um, then, because I'm the great assumer, um, he also has a, a communication device. So then I'm assuming that I should go back and start adding on minutes of consult so that that speech language pathologist has um, carved out time to populate his device with language and content? So the, it's a good question, the, and it's not a simple answer, again. So the selection of the vocabulary, if we have selected a system, a speech generating system that is robust, meaning it has the vocabulary and a layout and configuration that will support language as language develops. It's already inherent in the device. In those cases, there's not much programming that should be happening. Actually, there should be very little programming that's happening. That's a signal that we've already got vocabulary that's going to take us through high school. We're going to have ways to be able to say and express the concepts that we're going to be learning. That indicates it's robust. If we have a system that is not robust, then the load for programming is very heavy. Let me just give you my analogy. I have been doing this for, gosh, since 1987 was my first device, 34 years. I won't program a device all the way through to adulthood. I don't have the skill set to be able to do it. I'm going to miss something. I'm going to misrepresent, misorganize, misdo something so that the student is not going to have an organization and a configuration that's going to take them all the way. Plus, if it relies on me doing it and you move from my campus to somebody else's, now are you going to even know how it's organized? The, the first step is to make sure that you've chosen a robust system that already has a language organization in it that makes sense. If you haven't, then that's where I would begin is with an evaluation to determine a system that will do that. I'm gonna say hard words and, and I'm gonna put it harsh, um, but if you're programming everything you think your child needs to say, you're not developing language. You've actually stopped their language development by giving them ways to be able to ask for or tell you only those preferred items. Language is much more complex and having language to build relationships, build friendships, to be able to share thoughts and ideas and feelings means that we need to have a mix of words that can be combined together to make novel thoughts. And if we don't, then we don't have those building blocks to be able to build language. If we're giving your child 
the vocabulary to be able to tell us what they prefer and what they want, we're only giving them a way to be able to participate. We're not developing that language. That's a harsh spot to be in and that, but it's a hopeful spot because if we get the vocabulary right with the correct system that they can get access to and people who are speaking to them in their system, now we can turn that boat around and we can start developing language. Okay, so I'm gonna ask the million dollar question. Um, what do you think is the, 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 I almost said inversion to a communication device and I'll give uh, some parameters around that. Um, um, today I was in a lovely meeting with one of our amazing moms on here right now and I didn't scratch anybody's eyes out because you can't do that on the computer, which is probably really good. Um, but I said, we would like an evaluation for this beautiful girl to have a communication device and somebody who's very smart, who finished college and everything, she said, she doesn't get a communication device because she's an oral speaker and she's being fucked up. That's why she's not enough. So I said, buttercup, which is what we say in Texas. She's profoundly impacted by the acuity of her language. If I was there babysitting her or watching, I don't, I'm not going to be able to understand what she needs. And Maybe it's just where I sit. There is this great push for no. I, being an assumer, often think people's fear and pain points come from an inability to deliver that product or what is that product. And so I'm always trying to, I'm begging my parents to get a communication device. Um, and depending on their child's disability, they're, um, they're asked they're talked out of it by their private speech pathologist. If you guys could all Maybe mute we'll get ready. Come everybody, on, everybody. everybody can mute themselves. Um, and so I, it's hard for me to overcome that um, when I'm saying, hey, Cindy Smith, you need to get Billy a communication device. They go ask their private speech pathologist. Oh, you don't want to do that. You don't want him to stop talking. And it's really just the opposite, right? You don't have somebody who has surgery that uses a walker, so they never walk again. And you make really complex things sound simple. So could you give me as an advocate or attorneys watching this or moms and dads language about how amazing it is and in a way that they can understand? Because when we go and ask five other people what they think, it's like signing up you know, for Amway. And everybody has an opinion about it. So can you tell us a way to say that that's palatable? So there are a lot of myths about communication. And I call them myth communications. Nice little lisp in there, right? Sorry, couldn't resist. Um, so the myths have been dispelled over 20 years ago, but they still are perpetuated. They're perpetuated in the classroom, they're perpetuated from the pulpit, they're perpetuated from the table. They're just perpetuated and you have to be informed about those myths and misunderstandings. One is augmentative communication, it's been known for over 30 years, does not stop verbal language from developing if that coordination of those 100 muscles is possible. But it gives us a way to be able to develop our language while that coordination still develops. Oftentimes we find that when people have the propensity to develop verbal speech, they can develop that verbal speech, that they'll imitate their speech generating device and it kind of takes the pressure off of this speech and we see the speech improve. The bottom line for me on that issue is, it doesn't matter if it's spoken or written or symboled or signed, it's about that language in your head because that's what's used to construct understanding and relationships and friendships and work relationships and academic skills. You have to have that language. And so we're sometimes trading speech, the production of the sound for the language that is the essence of all of those other relationships. There was a quote by Daniel Webster, not Daniel Webster of the dictionary, but different Daniel Webster. But he said, if all things were taken from me, 
With one exception, I would choose to keep my power of communication language for by it, I would soon regain all the rest. That just needs to be at the heart of our conversations. Um, and I can't tell you how many parents have said, you know, I thought at first that my priority was my child walking until I realized that I really needed to know what they were thinking. I needed them to be able to communicate with me. And now that power is on communication. Um, that perspective means we move that conversation as soon as possible. We don't have good guidance for when do we augment. Um, but I'll tell you, I augment as soon as. As soon as that verbal is not coming in, as soon as the risk factors for developing verbal communication are enough to consider we may need to go that direction. And I'll tell you, I've even had a conversation with a neonatologist about beginning to symbol in the neonatal intensive care unit. And she said, Deanne, how would you know that that child might need the symbols? They might need a symbolic language. And I said, it's about respiration and the neurological system and their ability. So depending on what we know from that very beginning, we could begin augmenting. Um, we could augment real early. Oftentimes we'll know the, the really significant risk factors between six and nine months of age when that babbling isn't coming in as it's expected. There's no reason to not augment. I love double negatives. So what that means is there's every reason to augment as soon as possible. But those myths get in the way and you're going to hear them from therapists, you're going to hear them from educators, and you just need to spread the word, you just need to be informed. Um, we have on the, um, the symbolspeak.co website, we have a list of those myths. Um, and you can also just email me if you want the references for them. And I have a, a nice little handout that lists who the researchers were that dispelled some of those different myths, if you feel like you need to have that in a conversation. But we just need to call a myth a myth. Um, that's a myth and it's misunderstanding. And what do we want? I want my child, I want my student to be able to communicate. So that's the, at the forefront of, of the, the conversation. You know, you're, to your point, Karen, about people avoiding because I'm not really sure on that. Like you, I've got, you know, some personal impressions about that, that we're, we're not comfortable with the technology. I don't know the layout and configuration. I don't have a roadmap in my head for how to be able to do that. But there's so many resources out there for us now that when we do what an IEP calls us to do, which is to put the individual first, to put the student first, then the question needs to be, how is this child going to be able to express himself or herself in a way that novel people can understand and in a way that unfamiliar people can understand? Because unless you're going to assign somebody who's going to be with my child throughout their life, then we need to make sure that we're developing that ability to be able to understand. Um, yeah, I have so many rants going on in my head. I just need to kind of calm those down. But first is fight the myth and advocate for your student's ability to be able to communicate for themselves and to call it. So, you know, I have the evidence. My, my child is five years old and only says three words verbally. There's a significant gap in that verbalization and what he should be verbalizing um, at this age. So how are you gonna rectify that? What's your solution for being able to close that gap, not just keep working on those few words that aren't gonna close that gap. If we're at two words for five years, I'm not getting out of school with having enough vocabulary to do that. That's the sarcastic, the snarky side of me. So how are you gonna, um, how are we gonna answer that question? The other, if it's your private therapist, you're having the same conversation. Um, that conversation is, is your priority language and language development? And if it is language development, then how are we going to, to go about developing that language?
language um, and have those conversations. And I think the more, the more we have these kinds of conversations and the more people who are symbol speakers show up in our social media, show up in our conversations. And I know Karen, you and I have talked about bringing some of those into the conversation, but there are some really great role models who advocate for the um, ability to be able to speak in symbols and to speak out loud with their, their symbol system. And, um, and I think we just bring more of them to the forefront because that's the outcome I want. Um, I want to see every student have the opportunity to develop language to that level. Not all will make it there, but not all of us graduate from college. I'll throw that one right back at you, Karen. And, <laughs> Right, but we still lead productive lives, and that really is the outcome to have the language to be able to lead a productive life and to have relationships and to have friendships and to be employed and to be able to um, share our thoughts and ideas for ourselves. That's that ultimate goal of where we're going. We vision cast that, we tell people that's where we're going. Now, how are you going to get me there? I, and I, I want to say, as, as somebody that does a couple of these meetings a year, um, I do about 500 IEP meetings a year, um, done it for a minute. Um, if, if we do not give, um, if we're going to look at an IEP document, which, you know, the, the disagreements in IEP documents almost always come at um, eligibility and placement, right? Eligibility and placement placements, I know from where I sit, that a great speech impairment without something to bridge that gap is going to ultimately give the school evidence and data that they should be in a self-contained class. It would be hard and not, not wouldn't be appropriate for the, to, to put them in a class in inclusion with language and communication and they don't have one that is being used or understood by those teachers or parents. And I wish I could tell these parents of these beautiful two, three, and four-year-olds and five-year-olds and seven and eight-year-olds who mom can understand them, they're not going to evaporate at 18. Mm -hmm. You're just not always going to be there. And so for me, it's a no-brainer. But it's, I feel like we're stuck in 1960 and it's like, what's that? What does that thing do? But all of us moms and dads have had seen kids in strollers and they're nine months old and they're scrolling through to get to Cocoa Melon, right? So our kiddos are smart as whips, but if we don't give it to them, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and it breaks my heart. I have a, a young man that I'm working with now and, um, and um, he's about to be 22. And he's going to get a communication device that's amazing. And he's going to, and all of that information was, it was in there anyway, right? It was inside of him. He just didn't have a way to get it out. So um, is there a time, Dr. Olenek, that's too late to start a communication device? No, I'm going to tell you there's not. It does change how much, how much time to develop, how much that frustration um, is. and. Uh, the learning to be able to utilize it. Giving someone a communication device is not an automatic fix. We don't slide it in front of them just as, you know, Karen, again, you're going to be my, my model in this, but you're saying that technology is difficult. Well, if I hand you a device that's very complex, that's not fixing anything without you having some time to develop the skills related to it. Doesn't matter if it's an iPhone, an iPad, a tablet, right, a new computer, whatever. Um, if you don't have the time to develop the skills related to that, then you're not going to develop your proficiency with it. But most of us learn through imitation and approximation. We learn when somebody else shows us. Why is TikTok so valuable? Because it shows us, right? Why are YouTube videos so valuable? Because we can see somebody else doing it and modeling what we need to do. Well, that's what we need to be doing with that language as well. So one, 
I don't believe it's ever too late. I think we change the ceiling for how much that language can develop based on how much of that support is there going to be as we get older. But you and I are still changing our language. We're still adding vocabulary to our language. We're still picking up new slang messages and changing how we're saying things. That's the value of language. So it's not too late. But is there an optimal window of time for us to have the least impact on language development? Absolutely. And that is as early as absolutely possible, right? Because if you're two years old and not yet communicating expressively, you're supposed to have a vocabulary of about 50 words and producing two word utterances. If you're not making any words yet, you're significantly behind. Right. And so a year, there's nothing about time that's going to fix the situation to develop language through augmentative communication. There's nothing about time that's going to fix it without intervention, without that access to a symbol system that is accessible for them. Time doesn't fix anything. So that's that whole idea of, yeah, no, he wasn't really interested. He wasn't doing really well. He really only just kind of hit at it. I think he was just stimming on it. So we're just going to put it on the shelf and we'll try it again next year. Yeah, that doesn't help anything. Time doesn't fix anything without a plan and without intervention for it. So removing the system isn't going to, to help it or withholding putting a system in place isn't going to help them to develop that language. But the sooner we get to developing that language through augmentative communication, the less of a gap we've got to make up for. And so quite honestly, shout out to all of my ECI kind of peeps out there. Make sure they have a system by the time they leave ECI because they should be coming into school with their own speech generating system. And then it's asked and answered. In school districts, if they're coming into you, I'm just gonna give you a plea. If they're coming in for that three year old transition ARD and you know that verbal language isn't where it needs to be, evaluate for augmentative communication, call it in that transition, call it in that and evaluate for it at the time that you're doing that admission um, evaluation answer it right away. Again, there's nothing about time that's going to fix the situation. So what's the evidence behind that? Where am I coming from? I'm coming from typical verbal language developmental milestones. I'm coming from typical verbal language models. What we want is to help that language to develop as typically as possible. And that means we get them in their symbol system, a symbol system that's accessible as quickly as possible. And we speak to them. We speak to them in those symbols. That's the symbol part of it. Can you, um, Dr. Olenek, um, can you, uh, because I would have said, because I'm really smart like that, I would have assumed years ago that assistive technology and so when I ask for an evaluation, I'm going to ask for assistive technology and communication and assistive technology and written expression. So because I was so busy saying that all those years, I thought of it as assistive technology. And now as you described it, obviously, it's language, which is speech. So can you direct us to, because, you know, often as parents, we have to beg, plead, and plead and beg. And then we have to give our exhibits to the committee to, for us to be granted, right? So is there somewhere, is there a specific section in ASHA that would, no pun intended, speak to that? Speak to like when to augment or like. Is there something in, in ASHA that talks about aug augmented devices? There is on the ASHA website, but it's not super clear. Um, it's not super clear. And it says, you know, essentially to augment um, that some may benefit from augmentative communication and um, that we should consider it, but it doesn't give the strong guidelines. Those really come from language and our understanding of language. And so, you know, I, I personally come back to the language evaluation. What do we know about your students' receptive language, what they understand, and their expressive language? And when there's a gap between those two, when there's a significant gap, um, then we want to close that gap so that 
both receptive language and expressive language can grow and develop. That's been longstanding. Um, we know that from the augmentative communication um, kind of gurus that have gone before us, Buchelman and Miranda, and, um, and they come at it and Gail Van Tatenhove and Katya Hill, and there's, there's a lot of good information out there on the augmentative communication side. Some of the better information may be found from the United States Augmentative and Alternative Communication Association. It's called USAC. Um, and then there's an international version, which is ISAC, the International um, Society for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. And they're going to provide more um, directed information for the augmentative communication. Um, so you know, it's looking at where the where those resources are. I believe you advocate for your child being able to develop their expressive language and that you make the conversation be about language. For me, that's that's where it really begins. And that's where you tap into the specialization of your speech language pathologist. We're speech language pathologists. It's in our name, it's in our title. You know, language is what we do. So have a good description. And, um, you know, Karen, as you talked about the, you know, the, the points of disagreement that, you know, eligibility or the, the placement, that middle ground is where the PLAF is, that present level of academic function and that description. You want a really rich description that will offer a comparison to typical verbal language development. Perfect. Where Where is Johnny related to other five-year-olds? Other five-year-olds are saying five plus word sentences. Where's Johnny, right? How many words in their vocabulary? At that point, we're exponentially over 4,000 words in their vocabulary. How many words does Johnny have? You know, what's Johnny expressing and understanding? But when you make that comparison, and those are hard numbers to hear for us as a family member, those are hard places for us to be. He should be saying, she should be expressing, but it's in those places that we see where we want to try and close the gap to get to. And if we're not making steps to close that gap, we're just continuing to increase um, that divide. Absolutely. That's actually what I have down for our families. When there's so many places that um, that we document. I mean, you all know that I am all about data, 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 and document it. Um, the documentation should go in the plat, the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. That's that description of how this child's disability impacts them across settings from the bus to the bus to the bus and everything in between. And so, like Dr. Olenek said, you want to put that in there, the the specificity of his needs. And also, like she said, it's a hard conversation to have um, how far apart he is um, from his um, non-disabled peers. You want to document that need for the device and inside of the IEP goals. You need to put the language inside of the IEP goals. If that's how you would find out acquisition of information, maintenance and generalization and fluency, I want you to put that language of the device inside of the goal. I want you to put in the AT supplement, assistive technology supplement, if he has it. I want you to put in his behavior intervention plan. Um, if you're in a state that has an autism supplement, I want you to put it in there. I want you to put it in his individual health care plan as it relates to those needs. I want you to put it in his PCS, his personal care supplement. I want you to put it in his transition supplement so he can be an amazing adult. But it should be on every single page of his document, unbelievably important. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about, um, I don't know how to say this gently. I don't, I'm not really good at saying things gently, but I'm gonna try. Um, there are biases. We all have biases. I have them. If I, somebody was walking to me, up to me and they weighed 900 pounds, I would have a ticker tape in my head of how they got there why this shouldn't be happening, we all have biases. It's my experience that for kiddos with certain kinds of disabilities, usually that are an intellectual disability is one of their eligibility or multidisciplinary, uh, multi, multiple, dis, 
I can't even say it, multiple disabilities. Thank you, Heather. Um, or a sensory disability, um, deaf blindness, vision impairment, blindness, deafness, or hard of hearing. There's even more biases and we've all had them, right? Um, tell us kind of how you overcome that. Uh, sometimes I feel like, and of course we all know feelings have no intellect, but I feel like there's an assumption, and I don't know how else to say it, that these kids can't learn because that's what they're told or there is this. I always like this. There's a ceiling on their learning. And I'm like, you probably shouldn't hit your hands like that. That's going to mess up your knuckles. So, <laughs> And there are assumptions, right? How do you <laughs> overcome those assumptions from people um, at your school or that provide a service to them um, that there's not really any use for that device because you know, there's not a lot of cognitive um, um, acquisition going on. Yeah. Well, a couple of parts to that. One, cognition is based on language. So if you've already determined there's an intellectual disability that was based on there being a deficit in language. So let's fix the language first and then we fix the intellectual disability um, that's related to that. Um, and so there, there's many different arguments uh, on that part and it can be a whole show in of itself, but intellectual, intellectual abilities are based on language. And so we need to be developing that, that language for it. But as far as like that, you know, that ceiling of it, um, one of the things I like to do is to show people what the outcomes can look like. So often with augmentative communication, we have the expectation that the person's just going to say one word at a time, because that's all we've ever seen um, on a speech generating device. Um, we just saw them saying single words, and pardon me, I'm going to switch to a vocabulary set and give you a model for a little bit of that, but we've only seen them communicating single words, and so we think that that's the ceiling um, for it, you know. Um, let me get my speech up a little bit. Finished. Come. We're just going to say one word at a time. And if that's our expectation, we're not going to go very far beyond that. But if right. we have the vision for somebody saying, I want you to, to, um, to see or to look at what I have. What? you to look what I have. And I mean, I just made not a full grammatically correct, but I just made a two, four, six, eight word sentence from 84 words. That's all I've got. But if we don't give people the vision for what a complete sentence would look like or sound like on the device, then we're not helping them to develop their language. So we need them to see people like Chris Klein, who is messages from the big toe, um, can be found on YouTube, has his own YouTube channel, has a master's degree in divinity, teaches and preaches, as well as has been the president, past president of USAC, the United States Augmentative and Alternative Communication, runs a, um, a group called Halica, which is about sharing the gospel and symbols, and speaks professionally um, and prolifically, right? That's Chris. And we've got Lydia Daly, and Lydia has her own Facebook presence, which is Click Speak Connect. And she is about connecting with families and mentoring symbol speakers. Let's get some of them involved in the conversation so we have that vision of where that language can go and what can, that can do. Um, Chris will be the first one to tell you that, I mean, if people just looked at him for his physical disabilities and he speaks with his big toe, he can't use his hands. Um, to be able to do that. And so just looking at that, he'll be the first to tell you that, you know, people make and continue to make awful interpretations. They'll oftentimes come up to his wife and yes, he's married and they'll come up to his wife and say, how long has he been, been like that? Or how long has he had that talker, you know? And Chris has some pretty colorful comebacks, you know, but that just help people to see that, you know, he's a person, right? But we need to do that vision casting. We need to begin with the outcome in mind. And if you're only shooting for single words, that's all the further you're gonna get. If you're only shooting for wants and needs, that's all you're gonna get. 
But if you're shooting for, hey, Karen, I really like having the opportunity to talk to your people, then that's what you're going to be aiming for. And hopefully you're going to get as close to that as possible. But it's like going from here to College Station. If I don't know where I'm going, I don't know if I'm on the right road. And so we have to do that vision casting. And parents, you're doing that when you're saying, here's what my hopes and dreams are for my child. Here's where I see us going. Here's what I would love for him to be able to do or her to be able to do. I want to know what he's thinking and feeling. I want to know that sense of humor. Um, I want to see that sense of humor. And for many of your students, I'll tell you, it was, um, it was a little play on words that a colleague of mine used years ago, probably 20, 28 years ago, where she said, I look at my students and I give them the IQ test. And I was like, seriously, what's an IQ test? And she said, I look in their eyes and see if I see that question. And if I see that question in, my, in their eyes, then I know that they're there and they're just waiting. They're waiting for us to give them away. They're waiting for us to find them away. We're, they're waiting for us to help them discover the tools that are going to be able to help them. And we know that. I get the biggest kick out of when I meet a new child or a student, and I apologize to parents of older students, I use child as an overgeneralization, and I'm by no means disregarding our young adults and our adults. Um, but when I, when I meet a new student, and we start playing with language, and I'm talking on an augmentative communication device alongside of them, and we're playing with language, when they're laughing and smiling and teasing back, that's metacognitive. That is playing with receptive language. And when they do that, they're giving me an indication of their receptive language and their cognitive skills. That to me means more than any standardized test that I could give because it tells me about who they are. Um, I've got fabulous stories of people um, just showing who they are, you know, in their interaction and discovering who they are. The saddest moments for me are when I find somebody who's locked in who's had that understanding of verbal language their whole life, but had no way to be able to express it. That just brings me to a broken spot. I don't go otherwise. And I don't want there to be any more of those. I want to make sure that we're providing the each person with an opportunity to be able to express who they are. That's a personal goal. I feel like we should pass the offering plate now. I just, maybe we should sing um, um, some sort of gospel song. That's so good. All of this is so good. Oh my gosh. They're waiting for us to give them away. But that's what special ed is. We're giving them a, away. Because you all know I care about state testing. No, but I care about kids connecting emotionally, behaviorally, academically, language and you know, I can't imagine not being able to communicate. I can't even imagine that. So um, thank you. I want to ask my 800 other questions, but uh, I have all of these lovely friends on here that have amazing questions too. So I'm going to start sharing those. Um, um, mo most importantly, we all want to know um, her cell number. So Dr. Linux, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, it's at 100 Amazing. Just kidding. So her email is dn, D-E-A-N-N dot Olenic, O-L-E-N-I-C-K at gmail.com to say that she's generous with her time and her vast knowledge and her gift to communicate that would be an understatement. So again, I just don't think we can thank you enough for being here tonight. Um, so I'm going to have some email questions in and then I, I we do have some specific teachers on here that I'm going to let them open up. Um, um, Ashley, um, teacher of the visually impaired, I'm gonna let her um, kind of expand on that because y'all are both smarty pants. Um, so the question is, how is a system adaptable to be accessible for an individual child that is legally blind? 
So the decision of a symbol system is made during the evaluation. So legally blind, right, a, a loaded kind of definition. So sometimes there is vision that's functional, um, sometimes not. And so we can look at what the characteristics are of the symbol system that they need access to. And those can include Braille, um, on the symbols um, or on the locations for the voice output. They can also include objects um, and object symbols that have tactile characteristics to them. But I think a little underwhelming kind of characteristic is location-based systems, systems that are like a keyboard. Right? You and I orient to the keyboard on a QWERTY keyboard, fancy words for the first five letters up on the, the left-hand side, and actually it's six letters instead of five. I didn't count before I said it. But a QWERTY keyboard, right? We orient to the home row, and we oftentimes have a dot on where our middle finger is supposed to be on the right hand and the left-hand side. There are some systems that are location-based that the person can activate just as you and I would activate a QWERTY keyboard. And so um, decisions are made early on for how is this student learning best? Do they have some vision? Are they beginning with the braille? Are they learning by location? Are they learning by a combination? And then we would set the system up to be able to meet those symbol characteristics. Okay, I'm gonna let um, the great Ashley talk because I'm just pretending I know what I'm talking about, but you too. So Ashley is, um, one of our, um, we're training up a sea of special education bosses across this nation so that all of us that sit at the IEP 504 table can serve students with disabilities. Um, and so probably about half the people in the academy are educators and service providers, which we are so honored. And they provide so much value to parents and parents provide value to them. So um, Ashley Macheri um, is a teacher of the blind and visually impaired in the great Virginia. So I'm gonna let her ask her smart, Question, response to your question to your answer first of all first of all on behalf of everyone in the state of Virginia because I've got a few people on here listening to you thank you so much for joining us and sharing your knowledge um so yeah she she kind of hit my question the the, the the nail on the head um I know that in my system a lot of times we use of course our tactile connections system that's something that I use a lot uh, but I wanted to ask, you know, how we adapt it. What would be your input on legally blind, um, as we call it, complete or absolute blind, but also those with cortical visual impairment. I'm running into that more and more and more. And I want to learn more. I have some great um, SLPs in my in, in the state that I work in, or, you know, in Virginia. I'm in I'm a subcontractor, so I'm in six different counties. So I'm working with multiple SLPs and they're, they're fantastic, but I just, you know, usually they're talking and I'm like, okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I want to be more knowledgeable on that. But what I'm running into is a lot with CVI, uh, they're trying to do communication systems and they're, it's, it's obviously not tactile or if they try to do something like pro lo quo, um, even my students that aren't CVI that are just low vision, they're telling when I come to see them, they're like, Miss Ashley, I, I can't see this. I can't yeah. see this. So I just wanted to yeah, kind of absolutely. Yes. So we want to answer that question. And I'm like you, I'm seeing an increase in the in the CVI and the cortical vision impairment. There are a couple of symbols. Let's talk about the symbols first. Okay. So on the symbols, we've got size and we've got their configuration and we've got their coloring um, that we can play around with, right? How big does the symbol need to be in what location in front of the student for them to be able to best be able to visualize it? We wanna answer those questions. So size and configuration. Now we've got an interplay. There's a whole lot of assessment information here, but we've got an interplay between if there is a motor impairment combined with the CVI. 
So I'm gonna set the motor of impairment aside at first because sometimes bigger is better, right? We get a larger, larger symbol system, a larger system that we can look at with larger displays of the symbols. Well, we can play around with how much of that space is taken up by the symbol and how much is taken by the words and are the words on top or are the words on bottom of the symbol. And that starts to make a difference when we've got the vision um, component. So size, can make a huge difference, but also layout of it. We also have color coding with the symbols. So there's color coding system. It started with the Fitzgerald color coding system where we've got specific colors for pronouns and for verbs and for adjectives. There's modified Fitzgerald and there's another modified. Well, sometimes those color intensities don't really help with CVI to be able to distinguish the symbol. Sometimes they actually hurt that. So we may want to be able to turn off the color coding um, to be able to see if we get a black and white distinction if that doesn't help um, a little bit more. Another option is we have a couple of symbol systems that are called high contrast. And so they're black backgrounds with neon colors for the symbols. And again, just that interplay between size and type of symbol and layout and configuration. Now, just a caveat, when we have a motor impairment, bigger screens sometimes kick in the primitive reflexes and make it more difficult to stay looking ahead. And they may actually have to have a smaller system for, for that particular reason. But those are things we would decide in assessment. Um, now, many of the systems, the majority of the augmentative communication systems are based on visual search. You have to look in order to know what's on that page. That visual organization, it goes with the system that you talked about, it goes with the majority of the systems. Um, that visual load means that if vision is an area of impairment, then that type of organization system may not support the language development. And you may need to look at a location-based system. Lamp Words for Life, Unity, any of the different configurations, they are our systems that are constant for the location. Once the location is known, it never changes. We don't move them around. Every other system requires a visual search, especially as we add more symbols. And so considering those variables would be where I go um, when I'm looking at any of the different vision impairments, um, you know, for being able to develop language. And ultimately you're answering the question, how's your student learning? If they're lear learning by a visual search, great. If they're learning by location, they can learn to go back to that same location, then I would let that be the guide for the systems that I would consider optional. Okay. Two-dimensional is just so hard for, you know, mm -hmm. so and such a such a difficult playing field for lack of a better terminology and, for that. So yeah, and I'm and that's trying to yeah. learn. And that's where sometimes the location based really does make a difference, especially right. if their motor system is intact. Again, it's just like orienting to the keyboard because once you know, then you know, and you don't have to visually search. What you can do is say it, like activate it and say it out loud and then figure out your map for how to get there, right? And it's that, you know, how do you tell somebody where to go if you hand them your phone? How do you tell them how to find where your camera is, right? Swipe to the next page and it's in the lower left hand, it's two in and one up, right? You've given location, well, we can do that tactily as well. And so when your students do the motor map, for getting to that location, then they've learned it and they're not relying on the vision. They say it out loud and they know that they said the right thing and they can say it again, or they can keep searching until they find what it is. That's about like that learning process too. Um, sorry, let me get my, my handy dandy. So if I've got someone who's learning by location, do I have a key guard on it or a touch guide that's going to give them some tactile feedback for it? But if they're looking for 
a word, but they don't hit it. Play, like, work, time, come, 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 here. Right, and then they repeat the, the one that they meant or they stop talking when they get to the one that they meant. That's about babbling until you've said it or exploring until you found and you're using then the auditory feedback. We need to give students the time to be able to develop what that, um, what that is for them. Why are your keys the last place you looked? Because you stopped looking, right? Why is the last word that you said the meaningful one? Because you found what you wanted to say. Um, and so often we get we get in the teaching mode where we want them to find it and get to it accurately and get to it efficiently, that we don't give them the chance to explore and figure out, how'd you know that that's where it was? How'd you get to that? Okay. And they, they need time to babble and they need time to babble and make some words meaningful and us be able to respond to them. Um, they need some time to explore without there being a right and wrong. They need us to not tell them what to find. We need them just to say it um, and explore it and making sure that they have that time. Those kinds of strategies help us to make sure that we're developing language in the order that language develops. I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful to hear you say that, to allow them to, because one of the things that I am constantly <laughs> preaching to a lot of the case managers and other service providers are, you have to allow wait time. The, you know, don't get so frustrated that you just do it for them. Because oh, absolutely. So, yeah. I'm so, I'm so thankful to hear you, to e hear you echo that. So. Absolutely. You. Well, and it's, we, we don't produce language correctly until we get close to school age. Right. So if you're just learning first words, you're going to have some mistouches, misarticulations, misrepresentations, missaying of the words. And sometimes they're hysterical. And sometimes we want to just, you know, play with those for a little bit. But but they need a chance to be able to develop that language. And so there's not a right or wrong to it. The measurement, and this is going to tie back to, to the goals and objectives, but language is not measured in accuracy. Language development is not measured in accurately saying a sentence or a message. Language development is measured in ability to understand the expression of a variety of thoughts and ideas and feelings and representations. If you can help me to understand it, then it's successful language want. Oh, great. You want something wonderful. Not. Oh, okay, good. No, don't want that, right? Just we want we want that language to be meaningful, but it's not measured in accuracy. Accuracy makes it be about a right or a wrong, a correct or an incorrect response. But if I'm like, hey, you know, talk to me about what's been going on, you know, and and you might you might say Oh, have you have something cool? You have a cool suit on tonight. I see that you have that, right? You have, and I expand on it. That gives it language and, and meaning um, rather than it being find have, where is it? Come on, where is it? Find it, touch it. Come on, where is it? Put it right there. Let's go get it. Nope, you, you need to say it 10 times. You know, we if we wouldn't do it for verbal language, don't do it for language through augmentative communication. Yes. Golden rule. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so, Dr. Lit, our next question is, we've seen students make progress with a speech generating device. And this is from a wonderful educator in Texas. Um, um, a touch screen with pictures that produce single words, which breaks my heart because I know how old our kiddos are. Um, how can we use this approach that you're sharing for them to keep making progress and meet changing needs as they get older and more independent of us. So basically ready for transition. Okay. So um, I'd want to know a little bit more about what the, the symbol set. Is it a... Uh, sure, so we'll wanna... ask the great, um, so the great Martha, I'm going to ask you to um, pop on um, and give her a little more information. Ms. Kaiser. Da, 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 da. Um, I wonder if she's there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back to her. Courtney, will you text her and get her on? Um, I'm going to switch over to a question from Heather. 
hopefully <laughs> there's one. Um, Heather had a great question. She has a kiddo who has CVI. I'm just beginning to help her. Um, my son has CVI phase three, uses touch chat 25 WP. For him, we dismissed the Fitzgerald color coding and pick contrasting colors for the background of the picture. Ideally the same pattern on each button for each. If more button is used on several pages, um, then we work hard to program that button in the same spot on each page to limit his need for scanning. It's been helpful to say find the green but the green find the green more button. So this is Heather. Heather, you can unmute yourself if you want to add some parameters around that question. Or Dr. Olenek, is that enough information to answer that question? So you've reprogrammed the the locations on touch chat are are the same and you have the the core vocabulary on the word power is that correct yes so can you i don't know if you can see that very well at all okay great yes i can so it it doesn't follow you know about a verb being green or whatever but we've worked very hard when we change the colors that it matches every single time it shows up in his vocabulary um, and as we have added more pages for what's appropriate for a three-year-old, we try to make sure that is the buttons are consistently in the same area and the same color. Okay, so you're working hard to have to reprogram it because that's not innate in Touch Chat's organization, correct? Uh, certain pages are. Yeah, and so you've... Go ahead. Sorry, it's mainly the color coding. And then, for example, a lot of the pages that we add are um, a three-year-old. The most recent change is a three-year-old is not going to ask to use the restroom. We changed it to a three-year-old verbiage and also more descriptive language that a little three-year-old might use with gotcha. going to the bathroom. Gotcha. You, know, you know, so we kind of added that and that was not there previously. And he got the biggest joy out of being able to say the word poop himself. So it was worth it. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, so that's where we've increased his vocab that touch chat did not. Yeah, and that's that's personalizing and that that makes a whole lot of sense. And you can leave those in the same location as what the, the other messages were. And that way it gives him that location that'll stay constant as his vocabulary changes. Um, so if you're using the organization inherent in touch chat, so touch chat mm -hmm. is categorically organized. It has category folders for being able to advance the language and get to more language. So what's happening for your son is he's learning the categories at the same time that he's developing the vocabulary. For verbal language that happens where you learn the vocabulary first and then you learn to organize them into categories. Does that part make sense? So words are learned first, and then the categories that they fit into, we start sorting those around three years of age. We start to sort some into categories, more categories, four years and five years of age. So you're having to help him to learn the vocabulary and the category where it would be found at the same time. And you're just gonna to wanna to make sure that you're modeling that for him, that you're using that language. I think you need to go poop, yes. right? I think you need to go potty. Um, mommy needs to go yes. potty. Mommy's going in to go potty, whether or not you tell him what you're gonna do or not. But that way he learns that language, right? He gets a chance to yes. see you saying it and then hear it as it comes back out. So I would say as long as you're, as long as you're using the core to the greatest extent that you can, that lets him start assembling those sentences. Children shouldn't be saying whole word phrases like I need to go to the potty or I need to go poop. They start with poop, right. they start with potty and then add more words to it. So just making sure that he has access to those words and that you're modeling that, that's a huge mm -hmm. part for, for his development. Did I miss what your question was on the vision? On if you're shifting the colors, as long as you're consistent um, with that, you're not gonna get the benefit that would come when we get into the academic of 
our pronouns are yellow, our verbs are green, our determiners are whatever. You're not going to get that kind of color coding, but you may be able to switch him back to it um, as he's learned like the categories and the locations. Um, That's kind of what we were thinking. It just really helped it stand out um, yeah. more as a CVI combination. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So as long as we're developing that language, and as long as you're speaking to him on it, there's a there's mm -hmm. a little check for me for for parents and for educators and for therapists. And that is when I'm speaking on their system, if I can make the sentences make sense, and they match what I say verbally, then I've got the vocabulary available that I need to have for them. When I want more words, it means I'm figuring out that the student, the child is under understanding more words and I need to make sure that I've got those available. So I open up more vocabulary based on what I need to model to the, the child, um, and not based on what they appear ready for because that, then it's too late. We've, we've not given them enough vocabulary ahead of when they need it. We hear a lot of language for a long time before we use it. I know those are indescriptive discriminators, but um, it's hard to say for people how long we hear words before we start to use them. So you and I want to make sure that we're speaking the words long before he needs um, access to those words. Um, some of the literature has told us we need to hear a word as many as 15 times before we'll begin to approximate using it. And, um, and I think that number is actually very low. Um, I think we hear words a whole lot more than that before we, we actively try and use them. So good. So good. So one of the, one of my lovely friends, Robin SLP here on TikTok, she said, touch chat is frustrating um, in this way. It's not based in motor planning. So as somebody who doesn't know what that means, tell us what motor planning is. It means that location, the location okay. based. So um, the organization, and that's where what I had said a little bit ago, the symbol systems that use semantic compaction, lamp words for life, unity, um, core scanner, those are based on locations. Okay. Every, everything else is based on categories and categorical organization. It means that you're using categories that for a three-year-old, he may not already have developed because categories develop later, but okay. you need to use those categories to get to words. So if I want, um, if I want to get to colors, I may need to go into the school folder and then go into the crafts folder and then get to my colors, okay. which I wouldn't already have a concept for school or for crafts. Got it. So okay, a question. Next, go, ahead. go ahead. So a question that I didn't ask, but I had earlier. Um, and I, I, I always say, as, and I like making stuff up. I'm an evangelist. But um, stuff that I wish I wasn't making up is I can't tell you how many times I've heard, and I heard it today. Woo, we'll go and see what the service center has that we can use. That's like saying, Karen, we'll go see if there's some extra size six shoes and trial them on you. I don't wear a size six shoe. It makes me cuckoo. So when that phrase is said at a IEP meeting, what would be your grown up response? My grown up response would be that it needs to start with an evaluation that determines the features and characteristics that the student needs. That is the best practice, according to ASHA and according to evidence based practice. And that means that we evaluate and determine the size of the system, the type of symbol system, the um, type of screen, whether it's dynamic or if it's static, um, the um, mounting, the distance, the mode of access. We're defining all of those characteristics in an evaluation. And at the end of the evaluation, we say, here are the features that this student needs in an augmentative communication system. At that point, we can go to the regional service center and say, here are the features that I need to match. What are your systems that you have available that meet those feature match? That would be acceptable at that point. 
Um, but to start out there, it's a it's where we start guessing. So again, I'm just going to go to would you would you want your child if your if your child has to have a wheelchair, would you want to take him to the hospital and try him in the adult wheelchair that's just sitting in the lobby and then try him in the wheelchair without the footrest and then try him into others. We would not consider that to be an acceptable way. It's not acceptable for augmentative communication either. So tell me his size, tell me his weight, tell me his height, tell me where he needs a lumbar roll, tell me where he needs an armrest, tell me where he needs a lateral support, tell me where he needs those things, and then I'll go get you a wheelchair. Right, and I know you and I have talked about this before, and it's, um, I have, I work with only amazing school districts, they just have, sometimes they have people in them, and just like me, people are flawed, and sometimes I will get, um, um, an assistive technology evaluation, and I might be snarky sometimes, and I'll go, this is so tiny. It's like the size pants I want to wear. And then I'll get an evaluation that just like I'm drooling over. It has so much content. So is there something on Asha or I'm going to say it wrong, Isaac or Usic that gives us, because I hear this a lot, there is no assessment for, I mean, I, it doesn't even matter what I hear. There's got to be, I really think so, there's got to be an assessment template, guidelines, directives, components. Where would we find something like that? Really good question, because quite honestly, there's a lot of different opinions on it. So um, there's a couple of different methodologies. If you look at um, funding sources for specific speech generating um, applications or devices, we can get a template from them. So if you're looking at, you know, a Prinky Romic product or a Toby Donovox, or um, if you're looking at Proloco to go, those companies have some sample templates and sample reports um, that all follow kind of the same guidelines for getting insurance funding. So you're going to have more guidance if you're looking for getting insurance funding, then you are getting um, getting school district funding, but it provides you with a, a good sample for that. Um, but aside from that, there's there's not a whole lot that's tremendous. There's a there's a couple of tools that are pretty good, um, but I'm happy to if there's. And some people from school districts out there, if you want to email me, um, I can send you um, links to some of the templates um, and some of the Jeff Stevens sample uh, reports that are out there. Um, but the, the essence of providing a feature match description, a description of the characteristics that this student needs in the device. Um, what are those characteristics? Um, so what do we have in those? Pardon me. <laughs> it's my brother's nightly phone call. Um, so, um, and he's probably going to call back again. Um, so just welcome everybody. I have a brother who has special needs and we talk almost every night. And last night I said, I'll call you when I'm done with my Facebook live. And um, so he's trying to call me now. So don't be surprised if he calls back. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's a good way. I usually will ask him, do you want to be part of a very large conversation? Because I can put you on. And he usually says, yeah, he wouldn't mind. So um, anyway, um, so um, there's a couple of um, there's a couple of different resources out there. The regional service centers have access to them. Um, and searching for a template for feature match, AAC feature match. Um, and I tell you what, I will get um, a template put up on our um, Symbol Speak website um, that'll give people just some of the general kind of categories too. And that gives you an outline for the report. And um, I usually include the table in my report as well. Great. So um, if somebody wasn't, you know, over the moon, thrilled with their device, their evaluation um, that they received at school. Um, we know that if I disagree with the cognitive evaluation, I can go get an LSSP or diagnostician to do an IEE. Um, how would somebody um, get in contact with you? Because obviously you are 
ridiculously amazing. Um, kind of tell us about the evaluations you do. Do you do consult? Do you do the interweb? Do you do Zoom? Do you meet them in person? Do you go to Panera, which is where all good things happen around a butter pat? Tell us what that looks like. So first of all, with your with your school district, to if you're not, and it doesn't matter school district or if it's a private therapist, the, the main goal you want is for the speech generating system to be robust, for the vocabulary to support language development, for there to be a way to be able to advance the language. You want that inherent in the system. And that's a question you can ask your therapist is, how robust is this? How long will this system last my child? Um, systems that will only take your child, your student, a year or two years down the road in their expressive language development means that they're going to have to change systems at the end of that time, and you've essentially lost what you gained in those couple of years. So you really want a system that's going to take us all the way through language development, that you've got a map that's gonna help language develop to the greatest extent your child has the capabilities for that. And we don't know at the beginning of this journey how far your, your child's language will develop. We don't have the answer to that. Um, we won't know until we begin developing language. And, um, and so that's really one of those um, caveats of, of what we need to do. So um, with your school district or with your private therapist to have that conversation, that's really the first place that you want to start um, is about whether or not it will support that language development and what their viewpoint of that language development is. If you're not in agreement with, with what that recommendation is, one, don't accept the device. Don't accept the recommendation. If you can't see where it's going to go um, at the device trials, um, you want to question it before you invest the money in, in whatever that system is, um, because funding sources have a limit for how long until you can get a replacement device. If it's purchased through insurance, you've got to have that device for five years. If it's purchased through staff funding, which is a telecommunications funding source, you've got five years before you're going to get another device. And so if you purchase one and you didn't have all the answers when you purchased it, you kind of have that to live with or you need to seek another funding source um, during that time period that makes that difficult. Um, so it means that the second part of the evaluation is device trials. Device trials mean that you're gonna live with a temporary a trial device for just a couple of weeks with three different systems. That's considered optimal, again, by best practice. You're gonna live with it for just a couple of weeks. Now, there's nothing about two weeks where your child, your student is gonna show dramatic language improvement. I can't measure verbal language development in two week increments. It's not possible. What happens during those two weeks is that you as the parent, you as the educator, you as the therapist, as you're living with that system, you start to develop an understanding of how will I help this to make sense to the developing communicator? How will I help them to identify, to see, to see my language, to see what I'm saying, to help it be meaningful? And you'll do that for three different devices. At the end of the three devices, you have a hard conversation with the, the other, the person who wrote the report. What did you like? What did you not like? What worked for you and what didn't? But you also have a hard conversation about how your child was learning so that you couch that. When you and I pick up a speech generating device, we're already literate. I can read every word that's on the device. I can read, I can go into the word finder and I can search for the words that I want. I can use my literacy in order to navigate it. But you know what? Your student's not there yet. And so how do you help that to make sense for them? That's the conversation you want to have with your, um, with your therapist or with your assistive tech lead is about how that made sense. If at that point 
you're not reaching an agreement. If you're coming up against situations where they're saying, but we always use, or we only have, or this is the system that we would recommend, um, and you're not behind that, or you're not seeing that, then that's the time I would request an IEE or um, go for an outside evaluation, have an independent evaluation, but make sure that you're not committing um, to the purchase of that system just yet. Um, so with an outside evaluation, an outside evaluation does the full-blown eval. Um, whether it's myself or I've got some great um, partners out there who are doing um, really good augmentative communication evals as well. But when you have a good evaluation, it's called a feature match evaluation. If you're calling up a clinic or asking your therapist if they do that, you're asking for a feature match eval. And that again is ASHA's best practice. When you do a feature match eval, we do a history and information. I usually ask families to send me video of their student in play, in interaction, in communication. So I get a sense of who they are, how they move, um, what they interact with. And if they do anything with technology, I wanna see that because that starts to inform um, where I'm gonna go with the evaluation. Then we do a one to two hour um, evaluation to collect the feature match data. And at the end of the evaluation, you have a feature match description. Here's the size, here's the configuration, here's the layout. The evaluation ends with the feature match description and then the next phase is the device trials. Um, and like I said, a minimum of two weeks with three different devices. And at the end of the three device trials, there's three options. So it's three and three. So the three options are, yes, it's one of these systems, this is the one it is or hmm, I'm not sure I need some more time with one, two, or all three, or no, it's none of these, we need to start all over. And any of those answers are fine because the goal is to decide and assign a speech generating device that's gonna help your student to develop language. Dr. Olenek, when you said the um, three systems for two weeks each, that is, it happens at the school during the evaluation process or it happens in home? So you want to request that it happen at home because otherwise you as a parent have no idea what the system is, what the system can do with the layout or configuration. So if you're not a part of that process, you want to ask to be a part of that process. Okay. Um, the school district should be able to send the devices home. Sometimes they ask you to sign um, a waiver just of responsibility um, for that. And that's just really about protecting their investment in the technology um, for that. But, you know, I... I'm a proponent of, it's not always um, in all um, districts or in all private practices, but the family needs to be one of the major stakeholders in the decision. Um, because if language isn't developing at home, then where is it developing? Perfect. Um, all right, so um, a young person, um, I don't, I, everybody to me is a young person asked, um, my child is seven years old, <clears throat> excuse me with Down syndrome, uses touch chat word, power, basic 60, so many words. Um, I advocated for the last two years for modeling at my school, um, at the school. I'm confident that she has access to the device. She has access, ugh, it's my favorite word. Um, she has access to the device all day long at school, um, but, um, and has it outside of the speech therapy time. I'm told that she does not prefer Oh, I love that. She doesn't prefer to use it, although she has access to it. Yes, mm -hmm. actually, we're going to make that a t-shirt. I always say I have access to a gym. I just don't go in one. Everyone agrees that she needs to be modeled and it's documented in the IEP. The staff will use AAC as much as possible. Oh, that's not one of my clients. As much as possible, not a thing. Anyway, that, we'll do another seminar on that. So, okay. Uh, uh, as much as possible, up to, at request, those aren't things, but we have yeah. a whole training on accommodations. As much as possible, that sounds like my teenagers making their beds. Anyway, what should be the next step? So the, the first next step, I'm just gonna jump in and interrupt the great doctor is, um, that's terrible language and it has it ties the school to no responsibility. So 
you have to have it clean, pristine. And we used to say it passed the stranger test. Now we say it passed the dead man's test, right? That anybody on the planet picks it up, knows exactly what to do. But that language just uh, exempted them from responsibility. That's just the Karen response. But Dr. Olenek, what would you say? So there, there's a couple of principles to that. One, modeling is the best, right? It yeah. allows us to show. And we speak um, through language, through AAC, um, Hear My Voice, the nonprofit. We speak about dual symbol immersion, and we speak about there being a public symbol system, and that's the teacher speaking in the symbol system from the front of the classroom. And then there's the personal symbol system, and that's the touch chat HD 60 word power, right? That, and it tells us the layout. So I'm glad you put those details in there because I know exactly what that looks like and I can replicate what the vocabulary is. So good job on that part. Um, so I know that you've got access to accessibility. You've got the vocabulary that's gonna be the building blocks for language. But there's a couple of characteristics that when we talk about going into the classroom, and this leads back to um, a conversation point that Karen opened up at the beginning, which was about regular ed classrooms versus special ed classrooms too. The teacher load for speaking in symbols is, is great. Um, it is a great load and it's a great responsibility and it's one we shouldn't shirk um, and by any means, but making sure that the teacher is equipped and all the teachers are equipped to be able to speak in symbols. And we're looking at even what the curriculum modifications are in symbols. So touch chat HD, you're looking at symbol sticks. And so there's some curriculum resources, unique learning systems that support that instruction in picture symbols. And there are others um, that are available out there as well. So what's the curriculum? What's that curriculum support? How do I provide a, a tool for the teacher to be able to speak in symbols? Couple of other thoughts on that. One is I speak verbally and fast probably equally as fast as Karen does, but we're at 120 to 150 words a minute. Proficient symbol speakers speak nine to 15 words a minute at a 10% rate. Chris Klein speaks at about a 35 to 42 word per minute rate, which is still 33% of the speed at the maximum you know, 25 to 33% of what I speak. It slows it down. It slows down the instruction. It slows down how much information we can get. It slows down how much of the details, how much of the complexity we can get. And that's where, I mean, this is, it's a shameless plug for Symbolit, but I developed Symbolit because nobody else was doing it. And Symbolit gives us a way to be able to speak in words in real time. So from the front of the classroom, I can tell my class what it is that I have for them in the lesson and everything that I say is gonna show up in symbols. Now, the symbols aren't gonna show your child's location of those on the speech generating device, but your child is gonna see that everything I say shows up in symbols. Today, we're gonna to be studying about the planets. And as we study about the planets, we're gonna talk about those that are closest to us first, right? How much language is there in that lesson? If we start to look at other tools that we can give to our teachers so that they can speak in symbols from the front of the classroom, and then as we have a communication partner who is helping with that individual component of the lesson or helping to set up that um, learning about the specific activities or manipulatives, right? Then I can speak on the student's system or a mirror of their system. So a mirror is where I would have theirs loaded onto my tablet, my iPad, and they would still have their device. I would speak on mine and mine speaks as an adult female and their speaks in whatever their gender and age appropriate voice is. But now we show them that speaking in symbols is typical and that I can do it and you can do it. So we demystify it as well and we almost normalize it. 
it's very normal for us all to be carrying technology with us. We've got phones and tablets and computers and laptops. Well, you know, a child who's communicating on a communication device just needs to see that somebody else has one too. That's the social development of that, that social part of the language. So a couple of components, you know, let's make a plan for the teacher and how the teacher is gonna speak from the front of the classroom. Now, our school districts need to be very specific about whether or not it's a voice output communication device or a low tech communication device. Let me debunk a couple of things. One, one major myth is that you have to do low tech before you do high tech, and that is a myth. The voice output oftentimes helps that language to develop um, where, you know, when you're looking at a low tech communication board, if I'm touching my symbol on a low tech communication board, it's kind of like the tree falling in the forest. If no one's there, did you communicate it? If nobody's looking over my shoulder to look at that message, did you really communicate it? You also can't use low tech with your friends, your peers who don't understand the symbols. And so it's just changed your social relationship. You need a voice. You need a voice out loud to be able to draw your friends in. And oftentimes that's a main motivation for having voice output. But with our systems, we need to have those conversations about the teacher and whether or not the teacher is using a voice output communication device or a low tech backup. There are some older OSEP guidelines that say how long a school district has to replace a voice output communication device if it goes down. And that is part of the reason why school districts are afraid to put the voice output communication device in the, in the documents. If you just say a voice output communication device or, or his personal speech generating device and or a low tech backup, it buys you some grace with the school district um, to be able to have a backup for those times that the voice output has gone down. We want to bring those back up as quickly as possible, but it gives you a little grace while you're negotiating that. Okay, you're on mute, Karen. Oh, my first husband would have liked that. Probably all of my husbands would have liked that. Um, so um, thank you. That, so I'm going to, I I want you to, you're not shamelessly plugging it. I want you to describe symbolspeak.co because the first time you told me, I was like, what? So if you'll describe yeah. what that is, because you were just showing us, I couldn't mm -hmm. show my 14,000 friends on the TikTok. I'm like looking for mine, like I'm going to hold it up. I'm sure Dr. Olenek will send me one. I don't know if they go that fast. <laughs> but tell us what, so nobody's ever heard of anything. What is Symbol Speak that you invented, cooked, began, gave birth to? Tell us what that is. So Symbol Speak is the company that produced Symbolit. Symbolit is a speech to symbol translation application. And what it does is it translates your speech into picture symbols in real time or close to real time. There's a slight slight delay. I've got three major symbol systems that are um, in um, Symbolit, and you can use Unity or Lamp Words for Life, and those you can have, for those of you who work with those systems, you can have the one hit or you can have the sequenced. The sequenced, for example, and I'm going to take you to um, the lamp, or this is Unity sequenced, it's going to tell you how you would get to that symbol in the accent device, tells you the order of the symbols, um, but it lets you speak a message and it'll show up. So I can't thank you enough for inviting me to join you tonight. And so what I say shows up in symbols. Now, this is not an augmentative communication device or a speech generating device for your student. This is a way for you as the communication partner to immerse your symbol speaker in their symbol system or in a dialect of their symbol system where you can make your language visible. And so as I switch between them, then the words that I've said will show up and I can have it scroll or not scroll, but um, Tonight has been a fantastic night to be able to share information with you. 
And so if there is not a symbol for that particular word, then it's going to show up as text. Um, but come on, let's get going and we can make it happen. When I'm using core vocabulary or the vocabulary that's most frequently used, then those words are going to show up in picture symbols. So it gives us a way to be able to speak just as we do verbally, 120 to 150 words a minute in symbols simultaneously that just really helps to immerse our symbol speakers in their developing symbol system. So if we're in a school district and we're looking for those funds and they just take it out of the football money, is that where they get it? And I know that's what we do in Texas. I'm just teasing, just teasing. So the great Martha is on here. Parker Linick, she is an amazing lifetime teacher of kiddos that are greatly impacted by their disability. Martha, I'm just gonna let you ask your question to Dr. Olenek. Sorry, I had to put out fires at school. Yes. Okay, so I have two students with uh, speech devices. One student is pretty proficient with one word. Um, the other student, um, she uses the LAMP system, which I'm I just heard you mention on there. So I'm really interested about checking that out. Um, so we'll talk about the other student who's pretty proficient with it. How do you move, how do you move him from being able to use the one and once he masters that to the next stage where he's forming um, multiple word sentences when it, there's only one device, and so you don't have the appropriate time to be able to add what is needed to it. Okay, so let's talk about what the device is. Um, do you mind just going ahead and telling me what it is? Uh, he has a Proloquo. Okay, and you've got the version of Proloquo that you need to program every page? Um. Or does it have the pre-programmed vocabulary? I have been told, I've only had him for three days for summer program. Um, I have been told that we have to put more on there. Okay. And the, the example I used the other night was um, he wanted a marker, but the only word that he had was pencil. So when he said pencil, pencil, you know, I went, I gave him a pencil, but he didn't want that. And it was when I picked up the marker, he kept looking at it, but all he had was pencil. pencil. Okay. So Proloco to Go is one of those um, speech generating applications that has a, an old history and some of the configurations are still in that old history. It was our first application that was on an iPad and the original application we had to program every page. They've replaced that with um, a language organization system that gives us access to all of the parts of speech. Does he have all of the parts of speech or does he have actual photos or just a symbol in a single page that just has nouns? Um, no, he's got multiple pages. Okay. It's a symbol in the words. Okay. So if that's the case, then there should be, if it's an organization like this, then you should already have the categories to be able to get two more words without you having to stop and program them. Okay. And so if it's not set up on that, then I would have a conversation with um, your speech pathologist about how do we give more of that language. Okay. There, there's an old myth, which is we give them the language that they're ready for, but we don't hold back our language when we're speaking to a newborn infant. We give yeah. them everything. Oh my gosh, you're the cutest thing ever. Look at this. You've got 10 fingers and 10 toes. Can they count? No. Do they know cute? No. Do they know any of that? We give them more language before they need to use it. And okay. so we want that with you talking to them. Well, I have, right? And then you would look up and you would say the messages on the system. You would tell them what you have, or if you wanted to go get something, you would start in speaking to them on the system in your educational activities. And they don't have to be complete sentences right off the bat. 
Mm -hmm. They just have to be. And usually I start with verbs versus the nouns. Um, you know, like want and like and see and have and wear and even asking questions. But you want to give them the language before you expect them to use it with you. Okay. So your two ways to do that, one is on his system or a mirror of his system, and then the other would be to look at symbol it to be able to give him more of that language more quickly to be able to do it. There's a lot more to your question. Um, and so, you know, Martha, I'd love to give you more information on that. We can probably connect you some to some additional kind of trainings um, and courses where you could get some of that um, additional information about like how do you go through the steps. But for you right now, if you will use his system to you say a sentence, say it completely and complexly, right, as you know, he understands it and then put one symbol with what you're saying. So come on, let's get going. And you would say, come um, or go. And we need to sit down and get our paper out, sit or get, right? And in that way, when you're saying your sentence verbally, you can be looking at them and smiling and just being yourself. When we try to use the device to say complex sentences, um, no. no. What? what? And then we end up talking to the device and we lose our students. And so instead, if you say your sentence, I want you to do that. I do. Oh my goodness, this is the coolest thing. This. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Look, look, that's it right over there. And in that way, then we can talk to the student and then we just put one symbol with it. And then we get more complex as we get proficient with it, as we develop okay. our language. That may, and that makes sense. I would like to connect um, because as I asked mom, what is that big goal for this year? And she said, communication. I want him to be able to communicate more than what he is, just the one word utterance that mm -hmm. he's able to do. Yeah. Um, and the other with that is to expand what he says. So if he says, pencil, you can say half pencil. If he says pencil, you can say see it, right? You can expand and add more language to it. That starts to model that increased complexity. He's not going to know it unless you're modeling it. And the, the, the only picture symbols that we can kind of figure out without somebody modeling them for us are the nouns. And nouns don't get us to two word utterances. Two nouns don't make a sentence, never have, never will. We've got to have other parts of speech. So we've got to have the verbs or we've got to have the, the pronouns or we've got to have the descriptors or the determiners, all those fancy words that say we need a, an, and the, or we need, you know, big, small, little, or we need I, you, me, we, he, she, or the verbs. That makes sense. Thank Martha, did I hear you say it gave me the RCA dog twitch? Did you say there's one device for two humans? No, no, no. Each one has one device. Okay, I was going to have to get my special education boss paper bag out and start breathing into it. So I feel better now. Don't worry. I would be calling if yes. there was one device for two. All no. right. And um, so, <laughs> Dr. Olenek, um, Kristen asked, what are your thoughts <laughs> on partner assisted communication? My daughter communicates via sign language, but is not deaf. She has an interpreter at school. However, I found her SLP seems to devalue her signs because she cannot communicate with others independently. She's very opposed and fearful of speech generating devices and has quite the vocabulary with American sign language. Um, that's a tough question. And so I need to give a caveat that I'm not giving an opinion as a treating therapist, just as a, um, you know, as a lecturer too. Um, I think one of the drawbacks always for sign language for somebody who's hearing is that it impacts your friendships and your relationships because you're not able to go to them directly. Um, and so when you're not independent in it, I usually am looking for a way to figure out that independence. Um, I'm curious about the fear of the speech generating device, if it's just that 
people have demanded, commanded, told her what to say, made it be an accuracy kind of, um, of an issue versus modeling it and speaking to her on the speech generating device so she has the chance to be able to develop um, that language. Um, I would be curious if she would be reinforced by, you know, a voice that was um, of her own gender and um, gender and age, if she would hear that and see the value of it. Um, so, you know, my, my slant is to go to independence because of, again, the social relationships. If you have to go through an interpreter, you don't get to have your own friends. Um, your friends tend to be only those who will be able to handle there being an interpreter in that interaction. So from that perspective, I would, I would just question what your options are. Um, other thoughts on that or questions or feedback? Kristen, you want to share your, give a little more information for Dr. Olenek about that? Absolutely. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to ask the question. The um, fear is some sort of auditory based fear. She struggles to localize maybe where sounds are coming from in an auditory processing manner. So if there's a speech generating device and it is activated and she hears that auditory response, she is crying and running out of the room. Um, and we have tried a variety of sounds and voices and my voice and, you know, cartoon characters voices. And um, as soon as, as a device kind of comes into the picture, she is tapped out. Wow. Um, okay. But is, is very motivated and proud of herself when she signs. Um, and that is, is the reason that we've kind of jumped on that bandwagon is because that's yeah. kind of what she has chosen. But I, and I do really understand that that limits her independent social interaction, but she has kind of pointed us in this direction. Yeah, I gotcha. I gotcha. And so for the, that auditory um, kind of feedback and all too, and when you have that stronger response, um, so with, uh, and how old did you say she is? She's five. She's five. Okay. How about friendships? She's very social. Um, she's been in school-based programs for a long time. She's headed into a mainstream kindergarten program with an interpreter. Um, she's got a wide variety of disability, but is not impacted socially. Okay. Um, and, and at this age, children are kind of very curious about signing mm -hmm. and wanting to ask questions and, well, how do you sign this? And how do you tell her this? Um, so at this point, it's not been a problem. And I think that's mostly because of the age range that we're in right now. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I would just keep asking the, the question and because technology continues to change and there's um, there's options for us changing like the private voice and the public voice on the speech generating devices, having different volumes for them, some things we can control on an iPad and some we need a dedicated device to be able to do. Um, some can be through headsets to where um, the, the private voice would come to her through a headset and then the, the public voice might come through a Bluetooth speaker that's more down at her waist or something like that. So it's not that you have to change things um, at this point. I would just watch for those social interactions for the development of friendships and relationships um, and all. When, when a hearing person is speaking primarily in sign language, they're at a disadvantage for the listener has to know sign language or has to be able to use. There's now translation apps. Um, that will do some translation of the sign language um, and, and can display that. Um, You're muted. Yeah, sorry, I no? hit the button by accident. So, but there may be some other tools that can help with establishing the, the friendships and the relationships and maintaining that advancing complexity of it. Um, and so I, I would just keep open to, to looking at those and answering those questions as you go. If she's developing the, the written language, um, 
skills as we get five years and and all in, in school. There may be some of that written language to ex expression that may um, may actually be her alternative expressive symbol system, um, in addition to sign language. So, you know, developing that that literacy will be super important for keeping options open for her. Thank you. And it seems that that will hopefully be a method that we can take. It's we've just really struggled with an alternative communication because it seems that she needs that visual of a face and a mouth to be able to understand. You know, she has the same reaction if something comes over a loudspeaker that she can't localize. Um, gotcha. And it's a it's a physical like visceral response that you can feel from her. Gotcha. Understand that. So those auditory hypersensitivities and all too just, you know, can really disrupt what that auditory information is. And so, you know, trying to keep integrating that and helping her to develop strategies um, that will allow her to get the most out of all environments. Um, that's really going to be your key. Perfect. We have Thank one you. last question just because otherwise we'll, we'll all have to like take our makeup off and um, put our hair up in the bun and wash our faces um, or whatever the men do at night. I'm sure they do the same thing. So it says, that, just so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to translate it into Karen to sanitize it a little bit more. You should know um, that however much your device has been used is trackable. So um, if I've sent four text messages today on my phone, that information is on the device. So I have many times at um, IEP meetings said, hey, I pulled the data on the voice output device. Um, and it's greatly concerning that some days it's never turned on and it's never used. I've never had anybody tell me I was wrong. So it's if, if it plugs in, we can track how much it's being used. I also wanna say, I'm never gonna advocate for a kiddo to have a communication device if the parents or the guardians are not gonna also use it. So this is not about the school doing it. Um, we have to use it across settings, right? At the family reunion and at church and at, um, you know, swim world. We, maybe not swim world, maybe it was an example. But if we're not using it across settings, you're taking away their voice. So I, I wanted to say that. And then the last question was somewhere. Um, which is a great question. It's from Casey. How do you balance um, the recommendation for an emerging verbal child? And I think that whoo, emerging, that word emerging, it's so, it's like how many colors of blue are they? How are there? How do you balance recommending for an emerging verbal child going into kindergarten? Is there any right or wrong, wrong way on how to use both verbal and AAC throughout school? In what ways do you recommend keeping the AAC in front of the child that is verbal, but hard to understand? So, and then that hard to understand part is, is super important for it. If their verbal is effective, if they say mom, if you say like, what's the answer to who's your favorite person in the world? And they say mom and you understand it, don't make them say it on their speech generating device. You understood it, roll with it. If they say something verbally and it's not clear, and it could be misunderstood, then that's the time to say, hmm, you know, I'm not sure what that was. Um, help me understand, right? We, we make the device the bad guy when we say, use your words on your device, or we right. say to a child, use your words verbally. But um, keeping it out in front of them, if, if they're emerging verbally and they've got a speech generating device that they've been using, chances are the reason they're emerging verbally is because of the speech generating device. So you wanna keep putting that effort in that developing that advanced expressive language. Um, you know, the, the concern is if they're, if they're just starting to speak a couple of words and we stop with the augmentative communication, one, it may have been the reason why the verbal was coming, but if the augmentative, the language expressed through the voice output communication device was more advanced, now you've just taken them back um, a couple of steps and not letting, you're not letting them use the tools that they have to express what they're understanding. So, you know, bottom line for me is I keep the expectations for the expressing language 
at the most complex level and keep advancing that. If they're at two and three, three word utterances using their speech generating device, then that's where we want their language to be. And if part of it is verbal and the rest of it is on their speech generating device, that's still symbolic communication. You know, um, there's value in all of the ways that we communicate. And I think Deanne's personal opinion is that sometimes we put ourselves at war between school and home when we tell parents that you need to make your child use your speech generating device. But if he comes in to the room and you understand what he said, then feed it back to him and respond to it, accept it as it is. You don't have to make him use the device if you understood it. And that's places where, you know, you can pull up symbol it and say, I understood that you said, I want more ice cream. Who doesn't? But you know what? It's too late to have more ice cream, right? We can give the language that goes along with it. We give more language so that we develop more language. We can also go into their speech generating device and we can speak it. Oh, I get it. You said he go get it. And I did not. I did not get it. He said he'd go get it and I didn't. Oh my goodness, that's not fair. I want it too. Yeah, come on, let's go get it, right? So we expand, we accept what they're saying and then we expand it. We don't always make them re-say it on their speech generating device. We make the device the bad guy. Use your device, use your talker, go get your talker. Where is that? Rather than saying, not sure I understood that. Oh, I think you said, and then we model that more advanced language. Do what you do for verbal language. Do what you would do if your child came to you and said it verbally and it wasn't understandable and you wanted more information. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Um, use those, those parenting skills, those social communicative skills. I'm apologetic for the breakdown, for the communication breakdown, but you need to fix it. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Tell me again. Oh, I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, I think you said, I did not want to have more ice cream. Okay, great, right? I misunderstand purposely. And um, use those wonderful language strategies that, that you're already used to using. Um, just use those with the speech generating system as well. Perfect. Um, I just want to just give you a, a information about our amazing speaker tonight. So it's Dr. Deanna Olenek. Um, she's the owner um, of Olenek Consulting LLC and the founding board member um, of Hear My Voice, Language Through AAC, a nonprofit focused on the development of language skills using augmentative or alternative communication, AAC. You can learn more about her through www language through aac.org. You need to get an evaluation from her if you are not happy with what you have. And you know, there's a reason they call me the boss is because I'm bossy. I have never had her be anything but of great value to my families. And um, I only partner with people of excellence and she is a person of excellence. And we are so grateful for your time and your resources and all 500 of us are going to be emailing you. So we're thankful. We're going to have Dr. Olenek back on because she's going to be on with um, Chris and our other friends who are smarty pants and use their communication devices. And we're all just going to be amazed at the greatness that that is. So again, um, thank you for being on Dr. Olenek. I'm certain we'll have you back and uh, we look forward to all of your information that's going to help serve our kiddos. So uh, again, Karen Mayer, Cunningham Special Education Boss, remember, when we get it right for the child, we get it right for everybody. And we'll see you guys in the next training. Thank you.